please help me in welcoming Susan Rowan. I used to hate those stairs with handlebars, and now it's so nice to have them to help me up. <laughs> you never know where you're going to get material. Yesterday morning at about 4 in the morning, I was listening to MSNBC Morning Joe, and Richard Haas, a former foreign diplomat and former president of the Foreign Relations Council, was on. I won't say what he said about politics, but Micah asked him, what are you going to speak about? Because I heard you are speaking at UNH's commencement. What is your message? What are you going to tell them? And Richard Haas looked at her and he said, I'm going to tell them that this commencement is not the end of their education. It is the beginning of it. It's what Craig, Dean Craig Harrison alluded to. This is the beginning. A lot of you have been speaking. A lot of you have seen speakers. What you know more than any of us did is how to run the business of speaking. But it is a business. But speaking is also, it's a profession, it's a craft, but it's also a calling. But the fact that you have the business aspect will give you a leg up. And in fact, if truth be told, I am so jealous of you. Because in 1983, in fact, Craig, when did we start this? 19, was it the year 2000? 2005. We had nothing like this. And he did start this idea of what can we do to educate, prepare, um, inform, support the new speakers. If we really alleviate the problems because you have a network of people. And as Craig said, this is your network. The wonderful thing is you don't have to wonder who should I call that I sat next to at a lunch. You are the Ghostbusters for each other. That's who you're going to call. The Fortunately, when you use an old reference and they're coming out with a new version of the movie, you are in good shape. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is it has been a journey. And for me, it's been a particularly long journey and the most exciting one. My first career was as a school teacher. And when I started, I was actually writing for the San Francisco Examiner Career Series and co-designing it. That's when it was a... Hearst paper and not what it is today. And I was so excited. Oh my God, I'm writing for a paper instead of staying home at night grading them. It was such a difference. But going to NSA was really going back to school. And that day we had people that would fly all over the country to educate us. And I'd like to share you part of this journey, the things that I learned. Well, maybe I didn't learn how to do a spreadsheet or read one. I still don't know. And guess what? I don't care that I don't know. Because I have hired someone who loves to put little numbers in boxes and reads those things. The wonderful thing about being in the business is you hire out what you don't like. You hire out that which you do well, but you particularly hate. Ken Braley, one of our members, once said to me, you know the thing about you, Susan, and I'm going, oh gosh, what's the thing about me? And he said, you are not afraid to hire people to do that which you don't do well. Which could explain why I'm toying with the idea of having a chef in my kitchen. <laughs> Instead, I do the proverbial order out. Uh, I have my friends so trained that they send home their leftovers with me. I, I, that's how I do it. But speaking is wonderful. But you know what? It sounds great when we're on a stage and we're looking at this great audience. But as you know from How to Work a Room, What Do I Say Next, Secrets of Savvy Networking, speaking is also about speaking to every person that you meet. Because why, and I want you to remember this, and I think you better write down the number one marketing phrase that is going to get you to the next step. And I know you might think it comes from some marketing genius thought leader. It's from my grandmother. And it looks and sounds like this. You never know. You never know who you're going to meet at the baseball game, 
at the barber shop, at your son's soccer game banquet dinner. You never know. We must be speaking and in a conversational way so that we can let people know I'm a professional speaker. And of course, they'll always wonder if you're like Tony Robbins. And because we're taping, I, I'm going to not say anything. Um, but the, the truth is we all are different. We all come from different backgrounds. One of the things I said when I keynoted Winter Workshop in Chicago, we should never forget where we came from. Because when we do that, number one, the people who are there will never forget that we forgot. But the other thing is that each one of you has a rich background. You come from different ethnic, racial, religious countries of origin. Of course, mine was Chicago, so I relate to Al Capone. Uh, and my mother was from Toronto, so I think the maple leaf is a great syrup. But at least you know where you're from. We had a, I guess you could, it was a, wind, it was a regular program, and they asked five of us, could you please tell us about your journey? And I never thought and worked so hard on five statements I had to make. They passed the microphone like this one around. And after being in NSA for a very long time, when it came from a very different Southern Baptist background mentality than my own, I looked at the audience straight ahead, took a risk, and said, I tried to be a wasp twice, and for some reason I don't understand, I failed. And I said, but I could only be me. And I had to bring in the humor, not that my wonderful friends, Al Walker and Jeannie Robinson and all my pals from the South had, I had to bring in my grandfather, Archie Cohn, who was funny. He, Borscht Belt funny. And by the way, the Borscht Belt, that's a place, not a meal. <laughs> And you see what I just did? And I'm going to say this to you as you take the microphone and talk to people. Bring who you are to what you do. People connect with who you are. Very often I'll say, and my grandmother said, you never know. And I said, the interesting thing is that my grandmother said it from laying on her couch. Well, we were told that she had the brittle bones, which we now know is osteoporosis. And then I'll pause and say, that's interesting, because I actually thought, she was stuck to the plastic covers. <laughs> because everyone has a great aunt that they remembered that had the doilies, that had the plastic covers. Bring who you are to what you do, because we all had the outrageous aunt. I have a pair of glasses I'll show you later. When people stop me and say those glasses are fabulous, I say, they're my Aunt Tilly glasses. What are Aunt Tilly glasses? They're just missing jewels from the cat eyes because everyone knows that there was someone in their background. Whatever you could do to connect and relate to people. So it's not just speaking of people because you have a microphone. I'm going to encourage you to build your business. Talk to the people that are around you. I'm going to ask you a little quiz here. How many of you have a BA, a Bachelor of Arts? How many of you have a BS? OK. Well, today, as a result of you graduating from the academy, I am conferring on you your official BSDD. Now, you might wonder what that is. Because you have been here, you have something a lot of people don't have, and I'm going to reinforce it for you. This is the Roanne Awarded BS Detector Degree. Here's what's going to happen, and Craig alluded to. You will have so many people who will want to sell you their mastermind, invite you to their boot camp, uh, who will try to alleviate your wallet and your savings from a boatload of bo bongo bucks. I'm going to give to you that which I've given to other groups. Do your due diligence. Call your colleagues your dean, the president. Do not sign on the dotted line with anyone who promises you seven-figure speaking and a full calendar 
Or, oh my goodness, you come to my workshop and in three days you'll write a bestseller that will send you skyrocketing to the poorhouse. Because you're going to give them 10000 I just had a member of NSA that I've known for years tell me about signing on the dotted line $8,500 because a well-known author's name was on the endorsement. Well, <laughs> I am from Chicago, and we do have different methods of dealing with people. <laughs> the truth is, when everyone says, oh, he's a contract employee, the way I grew up, when you had a contract on someone, it had a different result. <laughs> so here's what I said to my friend who's on the other coast. I said, I want you to call your credit card company immediately and cancel. She was only out $750, but she would have been out $8,000. Now, someone said to me, Susan, I think you're a cynic. Well, I've been in the speaking business a long time, and I got worried that I was becoming cynical. So I went to my dear friend, Tony Boyle, who we always called the Empress of Audio, the Duchess of Digital, and I said to Tony Boyle, Tony, she was living in Chicago, I, I think I'm becoming a cynic. And she w assured me I wasn't. Don't worry, she calls me Ro. Don't worry, Ro, you're not a cynic. You must have people in your support area that really give you feedback. But then she paused and she said, nah, you're merely a skeptic. <laughs> but I want you to be skeptical. You are embarking on a profession that will have so many interesting, I love joys, and I don't know if I have to translate, but the oys. You go, oy, I can't believe I did this, or I can't believe they did this. I want to protect you from that. Uh, commencement is the beginning. Richard Haas was right. This is a great journey. You meet people who become your friends for life. I met Craig. We now, we can't go today, but we usually go to a Cub Giants game at AT&T Park. In fact, he bought me my orange Giants cap. Uh, of course, Cousin Eric got us the tickets, so that was pretty good. Um, also, have relatives that have good jobs. That's a good idea that they can get you things. Uh, Patricia Fripp. I went to hear Patricia Fripp in 1980. Janet was also a, a member of Women Entrepreneurs. Because I had, I'm not going to call her a mentor. I had what she said was a femtor. The late Sally Livingston said to me, Susan, how could I be your mentor? I'm your femtor. And in every book, I acknowledge Sally as my femtor and the person who coined the term. You may see it in other places. Those are people that read either How to Work a Room, Secrets of Savvy Networking, etc. But the one thing I'll tell you, you can never go wrong if you attribute, if you always give credit where credit is due. There's too much original out there to borrow and to not give credit. I could have said the line from Richard Haas and claimed it as my own, but why would I? Because I know that there is a higher authority and we'd all be struck by lightning. And I wanted to prevent that. Plus, as an author, I have, <laughs> in fact, Francine Ward is my uh, trademark attorney and we've had to protect the trademark of how to work a room, which is my phrase. No one in this country or any of our, um, I guess, co colonies, <laughs> I think that's a wrong word, um, it, that no one can use the phrase how to work a room to describe a speech, anything digital, uh, any materials. I own it. I have an attorney. So I'm really big about always giving credit. Even if you take something from someone's book, I say to people, you can do it. Only if you went to fifth grade and learned the quotation mark rules, because I was a former teacher and taught them. As we commence on this journey, we want to have the integrity that you've learned, the business that we've learned, but you also want to go and go, wow, look at this adventure. As you travel on the road, I would never have traveled to most of the places I've been to had it not been for being a speaker. But I also had a lot to learn, and I will tell you what I did. I hired a speech coach at the very beginning. I heard she's fabulous. I heard she worked. And I'm a snob, 
she also actually taught speaking at a university. So I knew she had the qualifications as opposed to the people that say, I'm going to teach you how to be a speaker. Oh, no, I never had, <laughs> no, didn't know how the qualifications and the academic research behind. Dawn Bernhardt changed the way I speak. She came to a, I think one of my first speeches, and she said to me, Susan, you are full of energy. Well, I was so taken with her feedback. And then she said, looked me square in the face and said, you exhausted me. <laughs> what do you mean? She said, you can't be up here in energy all the time. You must vary your tone, your pace, your verbiage to give people a chance to take in what you say and take a deep breath. That changed the way I speak. One day she came to hear me speak and I was doing this. She said, Susan, you distracted me when you do this. I bet you distracted people in the audience. Let me tell you how good she is. The next day, I called my hairdresser and had my bangs cut. When we get good feedback, we should follow it. Um, one of the things that I was very fortunate, and you've seen both Patricia and Sheila Murray Bethel, people who helped me along the way, Sheila Murray Bethel allowed me to shadow her as a speaker. Allowed me to shadow her. Took her life in her own hands because she asked me to drive. And, <laughs> and interestingly enough, it was the first time I drove our stick shift fancy car and didn't know how to turn the heat on in what we have as winter. So, but Sheila and I have been friends all these years. Patricia Fripp changed my speaking. I said to her, Patricia, would you listen to this cassette of my speech? But this is how old that was. Um, can you listen to this? And she was kind enough to say yes. And when she handed it back to me, she said, she always calls me by my last name. She said, Roanne, she said, don't thank the audience before you start. And here's the advice, and you've, I know you've heard her say this, come out punching. She said, when you thank the audience, she said, you are wasting their time. She said, if you, if you oh, I know, she said, they're lucky to have you. Why are you thanking them? She said, but if you feel so compelled as to thank them, do so at the end. That changed the way I speak. Now, I happen to have the ability to play off of whatever happens first, some people don't in speaking, and they come out with what's rehearsed when, like, rain is falling from the... You, you have to address the elephant in the room. I learned this from Nicole Shapiro. Whatever is different, whatever is going on about you or someone else, you have to say what that is. But you are embarking on this journey. I, I will tell you that there will be clients you'll meet that you'll scratch your head and say, as my mother did about her three children, what did I do to deserve this? <laughs> I'm not the only one whose mother said that. Um, did any of your mothers ever say, I only wish you one like you, so you know how I've suffered? Yeah. Crosses all ethnic, racial, religious lines. <laughs> and then when, they're, when your kid's born, your parents are in ecstasy because now you get to suffer like they did. Yeah, that's what people relate to. People relate to people think. And our messages, I want to give you a hint for how I knew my message. Um, that's, this is what I do. My message isn't what I studied to teach. It's how I live. If you want to know what you're strongest in, start asking people you trust. Don't ask the negative naysayers. You know who they are. Stay away from them while you're building your business. It's not that you don't need constructive feedback. However, one of our founders of NSA, Christopher Hegarty, once said, hmm, constructive and feedback, they don't belong in the same sentence. However, ask people, what do you think I do well? People will tell you what they see in you and what they hear from you, and you can start filtering out what you should be talking about. I don't talk about sales. 
I don't talk about negotiation. Oh my goodness, someone asked me to talk about negotiation, and here's what my line was. Really? I don't think you want to hire me to talk about negotiation. I paid full price in Tijuana. <laughs> don't talk about what you don't do well. And I would advocate as much face-to-face -face as you could do, whether it's FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, talk to your clients and see them. Bring a cup of coffee with you in front of your computer screen. Something else will happen. And by the way, there will be clients that surprise you. I had one guy that really totally set me up for failure. And it's not about you. It's about what the client did. I was speaking to 200 people in a room that was set for about 800 people. Oh, I, I know I think tall, and I look tall. I look like a dot on a spot. I was, and I was standing on a stage. The room was huge, and they had dark curtains behind me. People make mistakes. I, I don't think I did very well, but I will tell you what this guy who, maybe I would call him, oh, a dumbbell. Yeah, let me tell you what this dumbbell said to me, because I cleaned it up. I said, dumbbell. He asked me to, can you step in? Susan, our speaker, can't make it here for the next day program. Well, that night I went back to my room, Worked on a second program. I figured, well, I wrote seven books. I should have something. And I worked and worked on it. What he did, the breakfast before I started, he came up to me and said, well, what are you going to do for this? You know, you didn't go over well yesterday. Let me see if I got that right. You now want me to get on stage and do a great job the second day after you told me I didn't go over well the first day? Our feedback has to be timely and appropriate. But speaking has so many wonderful things. I, I, I spoke throughout Canada, five cities. I am still in touch with the woman who was a co-speaker with me. She still tells the story that we went to one of those amusement places where Canada has a lot of them, it's sort of like that Minnesota Bloomington Mall. And we wanted to go on a big ride, and she still says, the funniest thing was that this best-selling author and keynote speaker went up to the measurement, it, you have to be this tall to get on the ride, and I didn't make it. <laughs> and everything that happens is a story. Everything is material. And if anyone annoys you, bugs you, dare I say pisses you off, and I did dare myself, and I just said this, you take that incident and you make a note of it. Because there's nothing like using material based on revenge. But the reality is everything that happens is an opportunity for another original story in original material. And you have that at you. And the wonderful thing is you're going to know how to run the business. You already have what's marketing. You know what your one sheet should look like. You know what you'll encounter, and you are ahead of the ball game. You are ahead of the ball game. And by the way, how many of you think you might be joining NSA? I would encourage all of you. I have a, a network of friends around the world because of National Speakers Association. Uh, there is something that makes our lives global, not just because you've been to a country, but you have a friend there. Um, National Speakers Association, I learned so much. I'm always too tired when I leave to implement any of it. <laughs> but I learned so much. And here's another thing I'd like to give you. It's okay to say, oh my God, that's brilliant. What a great idea. Yeah, I don't want to do it. And who I learned that from is Gary Vaynerchuk who's quite well known. Um, I have his book, Crush It, and Jib, Jab, Jub, I, I can't remember all of it. Because in Crush It, he said, people come up to him and say, Gary, I've got a great idea for you. He took his father's one little wine shop and turned it into a multi-million dollar business. Gary used this phrase, and I'd like to give it to you. When someone gives you a great idea that you don't want to do, here's what you say to them. That's a great idea. It's terrific. 
thank you, but it's not in my DNA. And I had the opportunity to repeat that to him and thank him for that. It's not in my DNA. I had a gentleman who was in NSANC once say to me, Susan, you're a really good speaker. You should sell prepaid legal insurance. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, no, 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 that's not what I do. And he really got annoyed with me and he said, it isn't about what you do. It's about success and making money. And I looked at him. I mean, I'm a former school teacher, really. I did that for 13 years to make a lot of money. <laughs> but I looked at him and I said, okay, how are you going to handle this? How are you going to handle this? And then I channeled someone with a lot of tact and smiled and said, thank you so much for thinking that I could do that. However, I would not be as rude to my market as to confuse them by adding a third revenue stream when I already am a speaker and an author. But thank you. Now, you may think that that was nice, but those of you who read through the lines know I was saying a little bit more than that. It's OK to say thank you, no thank you. Um, this is a great profession. I'd want to close and say it's not just a profession. It's not just a business. It's a calling. It's a craft. It's an art. It's a privilege, and it is rooted not only in history, but ancient history. When you join the speaking profession, you join Socrates, Aristotle, Demosthenes, and all the great orators. And I congratulate you, and bravo to you. Can't wait to have you join us on this journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.